I'm Malcolm Van Delsten. This is an excerpt from Do the Wrong Thing, a book series or extra long novel that opens with a woman trying to kill herself. She says, I don't know why I tried to do this. And by way of explanation, tells her life story. We are in book two. Previously in Do the Wrong Thing, Ava's floor captain tries to update her makeup so she looks less trashy. I've rewritten the boy's floor captain piranha scene again. Um, I think I've got the catch 22 working now. So that's one of my main questions. Is it working now? I'll start with that floor captain scene and then skip a bunch to go to the next chapter. So that scene starts with Ava at a party and she's watching the handsome floor captain. I think he's watching me too. He is. At the end of the night, he invites me back to his room. You can sit down, he says, motioning to his bed as he closes the door behind him. The light over a fish tank on his desk provides the only illumination. I sit. He stretches out beside me and pats the bed, smiling. I grimace, though it's supposed to be a smile, and heart pounding, lie down. He leans over and kisses me. I try to kiss back, but my mouth is dry. Just past my foot, I can see the glowing green murk of the fish tank and the royal blue paperback with its bright red stylized human in the bottom corner, propped prominently in front of the tank. The book is Catch-22. I suppose it's meant to be a witty comment on the tank's lone occupant, a grayish lump of piranha staring out at us, mouth open. But does this guy even know what a Catch-22 is? Catch-22s are subtle mind bends. They are surreal, like you can't believe what's happening and you can't see a way out of the situation. Holding a dangerous fish captive in a tank is not a catch-22, even from the animal's point of view. I think the real purpose of the book is to say, ooh, look at me and my hip reading material. The floor captain stops kissing me. He sits up. I've got an early class, he says. Okay, I say. I've barely moved since we started this, what? foreplay? Honestly, I've been trying to kiss him. He is handsome. He's in a band and he's studying law. All the girls would be so jealous, but my body, I can't make it move. I'm like the piranha in its tank. I'm like the water in the tank. I'm sexy, dangerous, and fluid inside, but those qualities are trapped. I want to get outside my body, like the paperback outside the fish tank. I'll call you, he says. He doesn't. This chapter is called Boys Again. People complain about the cafeteria, but I love it. The food is delicious, variety, choices. It's like eating at a restaurant every day, hot lunches and hot dinners. On ice cream days, there's a choice of eight flavors and no one says that's enough. Right now, the sun shines past the tops of the evergreens through the second story floor to ceiling windows. Because of Thick brown panels at five foot intervals, the sun divides the space into long sloping stripes, light and dark. My tray in my hands, sun at my back. I'm standing between two long tables with benches on either side. A guy's on the bench across the table to my left, seated at the very end as if he's expecting the table to fill up. He's pale, shaved head. He must have done it recently himself because his skull is paler than his face and there's nicks in it. His clothes are all black his coat, sweater, or it's a thin cotton thing. It would hang down to his knees if he were standing. It's got a drawstring at the waist, I can see that. He wears it open, black t-shirt, army-ish pants tucked into gleaming army boots. I guess it's cool, but on him it looks wrong, like he's trying too hard. Oh, all the clothes are brand fucking new. That could be why it looks embarrassing. He smiles, hopefully. I feel reckless in my joy this morning. There's no source, it's only mood. I'm at the cafeteria alone, something I don't do very often, especially after my disastrous MRS experience. Can I join you, I ask? He lights up like the loneliest guy in the world, just back from the never-ending forest of, I need to make up a word for this, career. A combination of keen grief and that thing that lives in the throat of the orphan and the girl on the road, the creek. I sit. Julian has an accent I can't place. Man, he doesn't even try to hide how excited he is that I'm sitting there. He's a computer engineering student, switched from physics, he says. He never eats at this cafeteria, came here on a whim. I think there's a different one where the engineers go. On the phone, Ivan chuckles. I smile. Yeah, the letter I'd written him was silly. Two pages of minute description detailing the books on the shelves of the library in Macklin Hall, where I spend all my time. 
I thought the letter was cool. I wrote, wrote without editing. Usually I'm careful about what I say, not wanting to appear, well, silly. I hang up. I feel lost and embarrassed, alone. Why would you want to do that? The doctor doesn't look much older than I am. Then again, she must be if she's a doctor. She's got short, dark hair. She's serious, but not in a sad way. She's serious in the way I want to be, aloud. I don't want to have kids. This would be easier than taking the pill, I tell her. I'm afraid we can't. She looks right at me. She's not dismissive or annoyed like our old family doctor in Dardanelle, nor does she seem like she's going to pat me on the head like the new one who replaced him. My mother used to clean for the old Dardanelle doctor until Stanley was born. The doctor's wife made her dust under all the beds every day. The doctor's wife taught my mother how to keep an immaculate house. We don't do these types of procedures until you're at least 30, the serious young doctor continues. Wow, an eternity away. I don't expect to live that long. But I know I won't have kids, I say. I don't tell her that I'm afraid to have kids, that I think I'll destroy any child I have and that the kid would be better off not being born. Most people change their minds. Even at 30, we'd probably wait unless you already had several children or there was a medical or health reason to perform the procedure, she says. She looks at me again, sadly now, searching. Okay. I drift out of her office. I'm in another weird mood. Oh, fuck. What did I do? Now he's looking at me like that, smiling and shit. I feel my face heat up. I look down to hide it. He's watching me, smirking. I'm not high anymore, that's for sure. I will never ever smoke that much hash again. And if I do, if I'm high before French class, I will not go. Oh my God, he's going to. Why did I look at him like that? Like I'd fuck his brains out after class or something. He would have gone for it too, even though he's got a girlfriend. Shit, what did I do? How am I ever gonna make it through the rest of this class, the rest of the year? I peek up from behind my hair. I wonder if a lot of girl students look at him like that. He is sexy, the way he flirts, his sense of humor, even if he's not super attractive, physically, I mean. At least he's engrossed in helping Miriam understand past participle now. At least he's ignoring me. How will I get through this year? What have I done? Six women? He will go to jail, Ivan says over the phone. I don't feel sympathy or even curiosity about who the women are. Rapists lunge from forests and run across roads and jump into the cars of women parked at stop signs. Rapists are strangers. They certainly don't rape their girlfriends, who they can have sex with anyway. Who did Shadow rape? Did Yvonne and Debbie know he was raping other women? I'm not surprised he's a rapist, though. That explains why he's so scary. On the Greyhound bus during the trip back to Dardanelle, he stays in my luggage. I am defiant, though. Defiance makes me strong. At home, I take my teddy bear out of my suitcase and put him on my pillow. I feel bad about squishing him for the ride, but I'm not so defiant that I'm gonna sit on a bus with a stuffed toy beside me. I mean, I would if it didn't attract attention. I always scowl on the bus, put my purse in the seat beside me, pretending I don't notice if the bus fills up. If I don't scowl, people will sit beside me, even if other seats are available, and then they'll wanna talk. 